<clears throat> I'd like to talk a little today about um, the science we use to address landslide risk and some of the USGS activities um, that we've been pursuing over the last couple of years. I'm going to focus uh, primarily on post wildfire debris flows and we'll talk about those just in a minute. And so for a, a geologist and, and for the general public too, landslides are defined as the downslope movement of earth materials. And they can happen in a variety of ways and styles and the figure on the left there is a schematic representation, representation of a variety of landslide types. Um, it's taken from a USGS classification of landslides and it's really based on the types of materials that move down slope and then the style in which they move or the, or the way in which they move, whether they slide, whether they topple or fall or whether they flow. And then in the presentation today that I'm going to deliver, I'm going to focus on debris flows and debris flows are these fast moving slurries of of debris. This is the loose material at the surface of the earth. So soil, rock, vegetation sometimes. Um, and the USGS focuses a lot of our science on trying to understand how debris flows work and the conditions under which they occur, primarily because they can be particularly destructive. And that photograph there on the right hand side is a, is a debris flow that impacted a community in Hiroshima Prefecture in Japan um, following a a typhoon that impacted the island. And just some some high level discussion of the, of the factors that control landslide occurrence. Obviously, geography, geology, and topography play a big role. Um, although even places with modest topography can have landslide problems. And Eric Wagi later in the presentation today is going to talk about landslides in Minnesota, which is not the pl first place that typically comes to mind when we think of landslide issues. Climate plays a big role, so. Um, the USGS focuses a lot on rainfall driven or precipitation driven landslides and the climate obviously plays a big role in that, but not just the annual precipitation that falls over the year, but even places that are, are pretty arid here in the Intermountain West where I am in Colorado um, can, can be places with landslide problems, um, <clears throat> primarily due to heavy rainfall that comes from severe thunderstorms. Land use and land cover, and in particular, disturbance to the natural land cover, plays a big role in landslide occurrence. And timber harvest is one of those. Agriculture is another. Urbanization is another. Disturbance to the land cover that plays a big role in landslide um, occurrence. And with wildfire being the disturbance, I'm going to focus on a little bit today. Wildfire has uh, this unusual ability to change the soil properties. Obviously, volcanoes are sort of the spectacular example of landslides. So some of the biggest landslides in the world have occurred on volcanic edifices. We can think of Mount St. Helens and the eruption and, and rock avalanche that occurred there as being one as well. And, and lahars, debris flows that come off volcanic um, edifices and, and during eruptions or even when there's not an eruptions. And obviously, active tectonics. And earthquakes play a big role in landslide activity too. Earthquakes in mountainous areas can be very efficient landslide generators and the tectonic setting, the creation of uplift and changes in the earth's surfaces are also play a big role in landslide occurrence. Shifting gears just a little bit, this slide here shows an example of LIDAR topography. So most of you are probably familiar with LIDAR topography, but it's a, a remote sensing technique that allows us to see beneath the vegetation. And these two images here, the one on the left is an aerial photograph, the one on the right is a LIDAR image of the same area in Western Washington State. And that just shows you the uh, ability that LIDAR provides us to see beneath the vegetation canopy and most of the places we look, particularly in places with complex topography, what we see are landslides. And this image here, courtesy of the Washington State Geological Survey just shows us in sort of a dramatic example. And I think Jen Bauer here later in the presentation is going to talk about an application of LIDAR to some of her work in the eastern United States. Um, the LIDAR availability broadly across the country has increased the, the landslide mapping that's incurred in places and the USGS is currently partnered with a number of state geological surveys and NASA to develop a, 
an interactive national scale inventory database that, that's going to become available soon. And this slide here just shows a, a uh, preview of that. Um, it should be available through the USGS Landslide Hazards webpage um, here in the next couple of weeks. But this is a, a partnership that we're excited about and really to try to collect the various data that have been collected across the country in one place. I mentioned earlier that I want to focus on the role of wildfire in debris flow activity, and this is just a slide and some images to amplify that. So I mentioned earlier that wildfire has this uh, ability to change soil properties. It creates, makes soils more erodible and makes water uh, less infiltr infiltration less on hill slopes. And this is an, that big photograph there is an example of rills that have formed on a recently burned a uh, steep hill slope and the rills have formed following heavy rainfall and that heavy rainfall can create debris flows like those that impacted the community of Montecito in January of 19, or 2018. Um, Montecito is near Santa Barbara in Southern California and the area above there was impacted by the Thomas fire. Um, heavy rainfall that, that basically put out the fire caused some of the largest debris flow losses in the region since the 1930s. Um, there were 23 people killed and, and 400 homes were damaged or completely destroyed. And that photograph there is just one of the homes that was damaged by those debris flows. So the USGS approach to better understanding these, these events and how they impact society has been articulated recently in, in what we're calling uh, Science for a Risky World. It's a new USGS plan for risk research and applications, and it really talks about how we intersect the hazard science with the things that society cares about. And that, in, that Venn diagram intersection is this USGS risk research and applications. Um, and there's a report out just last year by Chris Ludwig and others that you all may be interested in, but the tools that the USGS produces or the science the USGS produces for debris flow risk and debris flow understanding really are found, the foundation is in some field observations or a set of field observations and database collection where we've relied on natural laboratories. So making observations in the field using, in this case, I'm showing here a rain gauge and a video camera to describe and understand the processes that are ongoing and using that understanding then to develop tools and approaches to reduce losses or reduce risk. And the graph there is the takeaway message from that is that the, the rainfall shown in the green trace that triggered the debris flow shown in the blue trace occurred at the very beginning of the storm. And what this says from a risk reduction standpoint is that if you're going to use early warning as a mitigation, you can't use the rainfall observations to issue those warnings. You're going to be too late. <clears throat> and this, it, this information we partnered with the Weather Service, the National Weather Service, to, to deliver debris flow early warning. And it, the debris flow products that the USGS deliver fall in a couple categories, and I mentioned early warning just a minute ago, but they really, the main product that the USGS delivers are maps of debris flow potential. So a description of where can post-fire debris flows occur. This is, these are delivered for major wildfires across the United States. Those products also include information on how big a debris flow will be. So how big will the volume be and information on, on when. So what are the rainfall conditions that are needed to trigger debris flows? What we're not addressing currently are how far debris flows will travel, but that is an area of active research. So I want to run through this timeline for the Thomas fire to give us a sense of how these products get delivered and the science gets delivered. So for the Thomas fire, on it started on December 14th in 2017, burned through the Christmas period. And right before uh, the new year, the Weather Service had recognized that there was potential for an atmospheric river, a big storm to impact Southern California. And that prompted the USGS to deliver the hazard assessment to local emergency management and the US Forest Service. <clears throat> On January 5, the National Weather Service issued a significant potential for debris flow impact for the Montecito and, or for the Thomas Fire area. And then that level of concern was raised to extreme shown there on in the timeline on January 8th. So the Weather Service had issued an outlook for debris flow activity for Santa Barbara County on January 8th for 
extreme potential for this. And this prompted one of the largest evacuations in Santa Barbara history. On January 9th, the, debris, the National Weather Service issued a warning for debris flows at about 2.30 in the morning. Um, again, recognizing that this storm was coming on shore based on radar information and weather models. And then about an hour later, an hour and 15 minutes later, debris flows impacted the community of Montecito. And we have very good information on the timing of this, both on the rainfall and the, t and the timing of debris flow activity based on some observations, including gas line explosions and security camera footage. And that map there just shows the <laughs> locations of some of these things. The takeaway message from that graph is that the peak rainfall intensity only occurred a few minutes before the debris flows occurred, again, leading to a better understanding of how you issue these warnings in an effective way. And finally, I want to close with some, uh, some thoughts from Bill Hook uh, from the American Meteorological Society, really on the policy challenges of how to reduce risk in the modern world. And the policy challenge one being a way to go about these activities with minimizing the interruption of people's lives and livelihoods. And the policy challenge two is really that the social trends driving land use change and urbanization and et cetera are really short in the time scale relative to extreme events such as debris flows, which really occur on sort of a geological time scale. And the policy challenge three being that it really requires this public private academic collaboration to build a resilient society. And with that, I'll conclude.